do you see yourself in five years? All oh, right, we did that already. Well. But where do you see yourself in five years? Better yet, what do you plan to do with the rest of your life? I spent the last six years actively trying to figure this out for myself. And I went from wanting to do literally everything in the world to I really just want to do this one thing. Just this right here. <laughs> from my own experiences and research, I identified three to four main things that I think are essential in order to be happy with one job. Later I found out that this is already a thing and people know this under the name Ikigai Diagram. In this video I want to show you how I use this framework to get to my answer and give you tips on how to figure these out for yourself. Let's get started! Okay, okay let's go. go! So the challenge of figuring out what to do with your life has always been a really important topic to me because I feel like it's a huge stress factor for most of us. Like it's something that's always in the back of our minds. And also, so much potential is lost at this exact point. Like, I see so many intelligent, talented people settling for something that doesn't really make them happy. Because it's not clear how to figure this out. So we try some things, maybe take a gap year, try to find ourselves, then find out that we don't just stumble upon the answer randomly. Or maybe we just decide for now on some form of education and postpone it until we really can't anymore because we're fucking grown-ups and we have to decide on a job and in distress we just pick something. You take the things you like, then try to love the things you took. No, it doesn't have to go this way. And I think if we take the time now to figure this out, we will end up with a much better result. Let's start with meaning. So for me, coming up with this model really started when I was probably like 17. I was on summer vacation and I was in the living room of our apartment having another fucking existential crisis and watching hundreds of TED Talks. It was super frustrating because they were all saying the same exact thing. They were all basically saying, follow your passion. <laughs> Just follow your passion, dude. <laughs> And it's easy to say if you already have a clear path and really it's just about doing it, then yeah, maybe a TED talk telling you that can help. But most of us either have too many things we really like to do or not a single thing that we could call a passion. I spend half of my time trying to dance on a fine line between way too good and way too extreme. So it's really on the brink of despair there until I stumbled upon this one video. This video said that instead of following your passion, you should find something that gives you a sense of purpose and the passion follows. Now in the research on meaning, there are a lot of things that are still unclear, but a lot of evidence points into the direction that having a meaning in life is pretty important for our well-being. It can help with depression, longevity, give us lots of energy and the resilience to overcome any obstacles. It kind of functions like an anchor into the future. He who has a why to live can bear almost anyhow. Spoiler alert, I later realized that maybe bearing is not the ideal state to be in for the rest of your life, but more on that later. But what means having meaning in life? How does it feel like and when do we have it? Now I could make a whole video on purpose and I probably will because it's such an important concept. But to put it short, in research they have identified four main factors that are essential for having a sense of purpose in life. The first is direction, so knowing where you're going in your life, having a calling. The second is significance, having the impression that our actions leave a mark, that it makes a difference that we were here. Then we have coherence, so living a life that is aligned with our values. And then the fourth is belonging, feeling like you have a place in this world, you're not alone. So if you don't know where you're going, if you feel like you're stuck in a job that doesn't align with your values or where you don't really make a difference, when you feel like you're all alone, then you probably have a sense of meaningless in your life. So from that background, it makes sense to really think about what gives you the feeling of meaning. Now this is not such a far-fetched thought, but I feel like it's something that we tend to overlook when we think about what we're going to do with our life. That feeling what you're doing is meaningful is really necessary to live a happy life for most of us. So you're probably thinking right now, how do I figure out 
what I find meaningful. And the research on meaning shows that this can be really different for different people. Duh. The most prominent source of meaning seems to be generativity, which means passing on a part of yourself, creating a positive impact. And also, there's a lot of research showing that beneficence has a great positive impact on subjective well-being. This duality that we perceive between making others happy and making ourselves happy doesn't really seem to exist. It probably goes more hand in hand than we think, at least if we keep a healthy balance there. There are many different ways to fulfill a need for meaning through beneficence. I believe that it is crucial that we not only help in some way, but in a way where we feel like we are living up to our potential. If I decide to help fucking North American ants across the street for the rest of my life, then that is technically helping. But at least for me, that wouldn't feel very meaningful. When searching for something that felt meaningful enough to motivate and inspire me, I discovered a pretty cool concept that might help you too. I started Googling biggest problems in the world and I stumbled upon this movement that does exactly that. It's called effective altruism. The website I found is 80,000 hours and the 80,000 stands for the number of hours the average person tends to work in their life, which is so much. Like imagine what you can achieve with 80,000 hours working on something that you find important. And that's exactly the point that the website made, that you can use these 80,000 hours more effectively if you work on something that is really important. So I made this example with Superman that really stuck with me over all these years. So it went like this. Many people think of Superman as a hero, but he may be the greatest example of underutilized talent in all of fiction. It was a blunder to spend his life fighting one crime at a time. If he thought a little bit more creatively, he could have done far more good. How about delivering vaccines to everyone in the world at super speed? That would have eradicated most infections infectious disease, saving hundreds of millions of lives. This really changed my perspective on things. Once I understood that if I had the choice between saving 10 people or 10,000 people, it would be a rather easy one for me. And that one also can do that. There are charities that are a thousand times more effective than others. And there are people in history who, with a simple action, have changed millions of lives. Like, for example, the Nobel Prize winner, Karl Landsteiner, who discovered blood groups and thus enabling hundreds of millions of life-saving operations. There's so many amazing people out there wanting to help. I imagined what a world would look like. They would like. all do the most effective thing and so instead of maybe doing the obvious one, which isn't necessarily the best choice. Maybe a bit cheesy, but just like Superman in the example. And this impact can obviously be different for different people. Like if you have a especially good fit for something, then working on that may be more effective than working on a problem that affects more sentient beings. But all of this is discussed in much greater detail on the website of 80,000 Hours and also on the Effective Altruism website. They put a lot of research into what they judge as the most pressing problems. They also have a lot of tools and tips to figure this out for yourself, so this is a really good practical and more detailed addition to what I'm saying in this video. What coming across this concept that for me personally was that once I realized, okay, I could potentially help so many more living beings, that was something I couldn't really unknow at this point. And that if I simply followed my passion, I would feel like I was looking away and like simply turning a blind eye on all the suffering that I could help preventing. So I wouldn't really feel good about myself because of that I could rule out quite some other possibilities because they wouldn't align with my values. Let's get to skill. So my best guess here is that skill probably is necessary for a fulfilling job, in part because it represents one of the fundamental psychological needs, which is competence. But I think not for every job, it has to be limited to what we just happen to be good at at the moment. A lot of times we can learn the necessary skills. And we can also ask ourselves, how likely is it that I'm going to become decently <laughs> good at this? So yeah, it depends on how specialized the job that you're doing is and like, which skill level is required for that. Now it can help you deciding which path to take. For a lot of people at a certain point, they have built up a lot of career capital. So it makes sense to use that. And I also think that it can help you figure out meaning. Because as I mentioned before, if you have an especially good fit for a certain purpose, then you might end up achieving a lot more in this. And also a lot of times skill can point to things that we're passionate about because they tend to be really closely related. Like we enjoy doing the things that we're good at more 
and we tend to become good at the things that we enjoy. And also that we're not passionate about, because if we're really good at something and we still don't love doing it, I think then we know pretty much for sure that this isn't our passion. When we think about skills in general, I feel like this distinction can be really helpful. Hard skills we all know, like for example, uh, being able to speak a language could be a hard skill, like anything that is specific to a certain subject. Then we have soft skills, which are skills that are applicable to all professions. Like for example, being able to see the big picture pretty well, like connect different seemingly unrelated things. And also, I think it's all about recognizing patterns, like similarities in the things that you enjoy. Or if other people tend to tell you that you're really good at people stuff, you know, like uh, understanding how people work and people tell you that you're really empathetic, then that might be a really good hint. For me, for example, as silly as that sounds, I actually learned a lot about myself while playing a brain training app. I noticed that there were certain games that I found much more enjoyable than others. When I thought about why, I noticed that in all of these games you had to manage and like connect a lot of different things at the same time and find more effective ways to tackle them. Then I realized that this is really similar to how I approach other types of problems. So knowing that, that really helped me thinking about how I could best assist the cause that I find meaningful enough. Passion. So before, I really thought that it was only about finding what you find meaningful. Until I was sort of in between two causes and couldn't decide. And a friend pointed out to me that when I was talking about the one cause, my eyes would lit up and that it's really obvious how passionate I feel towards this thing. And then during that conversation, I realized that I would probably never become as good in this one thing while well, it felt like an obligation to do it as in the other thing that I had a genuine passion for. So that's where I realized that passion isn't completely off the table. Goals that potentially determine the rest of our lives shouldn't only be fun to achieve, but also fun to chase. Now, surprise, passion is also a really big topic, which is why I'm going to do a separate video on it to address all sorts of questions all around passion. Questions like, how do I find my passion if I have too many or not a single one? And how important is passion for well-being and job fulfillment for different people? So even though I want to make this separate video, I want to give you some tips here on what helped me. For me, there's a difference between things that I like to do and things that I love doing. The second one I experience is more intense, more important or like meaningful. And also they make me overcome the growing pain that is necessary to become better at it. So for example, you know, when I'm surfing, I come out of the water like black and blue and like, bleeding out of every single <laughs> And the only thing that I want to do is like go right back in, even though I'm <laughs> hurting so much. I am taking this difference provisorically here as a basis, but it may be that for you, passion doesn't play such an important role. One thing that I think is difficult for a lot of people and also was for me is how can I know whether I just like something or whether it's a passion. With time I notice a few heuristics that can help make the distinction. So first, with the things I just like to do, if I would never be able to do them ever again in my life, I wouldn't be too sad. So that may be a helpful question. Also, if I could do only one thing for the rest of my life, what would it be? Another question might be, if I have endless money, what would I spend my time with? And ideally, eventually we come to a place where we can say, this thing right here, wanna change nothing. I also tend to find the things that I love doing significant. So that points to a connection here to meaning. Another difference that I noticed is that for the things that I love doing, I get so excited. I get so much energy out of it. And it gave me this feeling of, ah, I love this so much. <laughs> Which is different from just like, this is nice. So for example, I noticed time after time how I got disproportionately excited and like energetic after talking for hours about deep stuff. Now, I'm a generally fairly enthusiastic person. So maybe that's not that generalizable. But maybe the question people told me, hey, do you want to come over? We're doing... <laughs> certain activity like here's this person this person also likes to do this like what would really excite you you'd be like say no more i'm coming over immediately 
So what are the things that you can imagine doing for hours on end where you get into a real flow state and like really enjoy yourself a lot doing them? What have you always done just for fun? Another thing that played into this and that might also help you is patterns. Again, later I noticed that with all the paths I've been interested in, they've always been like the new thing that I thought helped me the most in understanding the world. So like physics, neuroscience, philosophy, and that that is like the meta thing that I'm truly passionate about. Maybe you discover similar patterns for various career paths that you thought about in the past, and that can give you clues to your underlying passions. For me, this was also connected that I'm really passionate about making new experiences and like experiencing everything once in my lifetime. So I really searched for a job where I could combine that. If you don't have anything that you're really passionate about, it obviously can be a good thing to try out more things. Also find something that you find meaningful, but also know that there may be different reasons why you're not feeling as passionate about something as you could. So what are these possible obstacles for passion? This thing that we talked about earlier that things are more fun when we're better at it is quite an important one, I think. If you have a hunch that something could potentially be really fun, it might make sense to try to get better at it. And also not to be too discouraged if something where you thought you might be passionate about isn't so much fun yet, if you just <laughs> kind of suck at it. Another thing is pressure. Pressure can really lead to activities not being as fun as they could be. So whether it is from the outside or self-generated. It was something that I really noticed while making this video. So that was internal pressure, but I also experienced external pressure at the same time. Because technically I'm making these videos for other people, but I'm also doing them because I want to express myself creatively. But the most creative expression might not be the best delivery of a topic. And I think that's a conflict that a lot of people have. How can I get paid for the thing that I love doing and still love doing it. Or to put it more abstractly, how can I keep my intrinsic motivation once extrinsic motivation comes into play? In the process of making this video, I found some ways and attitudes for how to deal with it. If you're interested, write me a comment, then I maybe make a video about it. So these three things, finding something that you find meaningful, that you love doing and that you're good at, more or less, have proven to be essential in my life. And the AKI diagram is a really helpful tool to apply that concretely in your own life. And in the diagram is basically just the things that I talked about plus getting paid for it. You achieve Ikigai when you combine your passion and your talents in order to contribute to society. So you can see pretty well what happens when only two or three of the circles overlap, which is what I've experienced in my life and made me come to this conclusion that, oh, it needs to be the four of them all combined. So how I use this, for example, as I mentioned before, music would be one of those that doesn't overlap with all of them. Like I love doing music. I think I'm decent at it, but I wouldn't feel like I would contribute as much as I could. And that's how it was with all the other things that I considered, except with what I chose now. I find this representation of the model super helpful first, because you can see which possibility fits into all three to four of them. Or like also see what stands in each category and then where the natural sort of overlap is. Maybe also like how you could integrate some of the other categories into your path. And secondly, also because it allows you to have more of a meta perspective on it. Because for example, with the thing that I chose, it doesn't have to be YouTube videos. It could be any other sort of format or like another version of that. So if that doesn't work out, I know what to look out for. And just another disclaimer to take off the pressure, what we figure out here doesn't have to be forever. We're just making our best guess over and over again. And of course, this whole thing is not easy, but I personally think that if you take the time, sit down, try to answer these questions for yourself, you can get to a, at least a provisional answer in a relatively short amount of time, like surprisingly short amount of time. It's not easy, but it's easier than we think, and it's possible. Now to really take something away from this video, I have summarized all of the questions and you can just pause and think about them and no commitment, just like what comes to your mind or come back to it later. Also tell me if you had any new insights, if the video helped you at all, it would be really cool to hear. Because my goal with this channel is really not to pass on ideas that are set in stone, but to also come into an exchange of ideas and like improve them together so that we can 
help each other and inspire each other with the spirit that is just about learning. If you like the video, please like the video and also subscribe. If you haven't seen my last video where I explain the concept of this channel and express a decent amount of existential angst, you can watch it. Thank you so much for watching and bye bye!